little video, all I'm going to be talking about is carbohydrate biosynthesis. We're going to get part way into the notes here for this section. So plants are extremely versatile in biosynthesis because they can build organic molecules from CO2. We can't. We can't build carbohydrates, but plants can. And they do this by using the energy from the sunlight to support this biosynthesis. And so um, what's really cool about that is that they can also adopt to a variety of environmental situations. So think about plants that grow in really hot weather or really cold weather, or plants that grow under lots of sunlight or little sunlight, so they have adapted to this environmental situation. So the uh, first section of these notes is talking about CO2 and how it's assimilated by the plants. And so the uh, light-driven synthesis reactions of photosynthesis, so I'm going to take it back to GenBio here, is going to provide energy. So it's going to provide ATP and NADH, NADPH, excuse me. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow us to take the CO2 um, and water, and it's going to allow us to combine it into triose, which are our three carbohydrates, and then into our hexose, and then that's going to allow us to get into our sucrose, or starch, or cellulose, or our pentose phosphates. And what are our pentose phosphates made? Um, we already have gone through that pathway, and we're going to be able to make DNA, or RNA, or protein, or lipids from the pentose phosphate pathway. So this all starts with the beginning of photosynthesis, but really what we're talking about is how do we create these carbohydrates? So here's the cycle that actually occurs. So it, it's called the Kelvin cycle. So the assimilation of CO2 occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast, and it's through this process called the Kelvin cycle. The key intermediate is known as ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate which is this molecule, which is constantly being regenerated, but we have to use ATP to do that. So we're going to talk about that, but you can see that there's at least two input of ATP, and then look, we have an NADPH that's also inputting energy. So it's going to cost energy to make carbs, and that should make sense, because we release energy when we break those bonds, when we break it down through glycolysis. The key enzyme for this process is something called ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. Oh, I know, right? Crazy. So it's this little molecule here. Um, this is commonly known as rubisco, and so I'm going to call it rubisco, R-U-B-I-S-E-O, and it's probably the most abundant protein on Earth because plants are way more abundant than um, any other molecule, and all plants do this. And so this is an enzyme that is involved in us being able to reduce CO2. So we're going to reduce CO2 with NADPH, and we're going to um, that has been generated in the light reactions of, of photosynthesis, and that's going to allow us to create carbohydrates. Yay! Okay, so there are three stages of CO2 assimilation. So the first stage is called fixation, and this is whenever we bring in our CO2. So again, um, we're going to have three CO2s enter into the Kelvin cycle, and through the net synthesis, um, what's going to allow us to actually create is we're actually only going to create uh, one three carbon molecule because we have to regenerate this molecule here. So, And that makes sense. If we bring three carbons in, we're going to generate one three carbon molecule. So I'm going to go back just for a second. So that's why this first step is the triose phosphate. We have to have two cycles of the Kelvin cycle before we can get into our hexose or we can get the six carbon uh, carbohydrates. So that's kind of the first stage is just, hey, the CO2 comes in um, and brought into the cycle. The second stage of CO2 photo, uh, or CO2 assimilation, excuse me, is when the 3 phosphoglycerate, which is this molecule right here, is um, going to be converted into glycerate 3 phosphate, which is this arrow here. So this is the red arrows. That's what we're following here in the second cycle, the second stage. The third stage of CO2 assimilation, that's what we're talking about here, is um, when we are converting those triose phosphates, right? So we have uh, three carbons here. We have three carbons here. They all have phosphates on them. And we're going to convert them into the starting products um, six carbon molecules. And so this is a relatively complex process. If you look, there's nine steps. I'm not going to make you learn the nine steps. Um, but this is how we're going to go through this process. So again, 
first stage, we're going to have our carbon fixation. Second stage is whenever we look through the fate of our glycerol, uh, glycerol aldehyde three phosphate, right? So this is what we're doing is we're going to reduce that stage. So essentially what we're doing is we're converting this to a starch. Again, this is the second stage is going to occur in the chloroplast. Um, and then we're going to have to recycle and get our ribulose 1,5-phosphate. So the second stage is going to help us do that. And then the third stage, that is that interconversion of the triose phosphates. Okay, so we have something coming off of this and what, what happens to it. So we have to regenerate our acceptor. Um, and so this occurs, our ribulose 1,5-phosphate is going to reoccur there. So I'm going to, but it's a very long process that I'm not going to make you learn. All I'm, all I want you guys to understand, is really what are we doing here? We're recreating our ribulose one five bisphosphate, and it's at the cost of ATP as we go through. So here are some stoichiometry and energy cost of us being able to build things with CO2. So first of all, we have three CO2s that come in. So this is that fixation of our three CO2s. And what it's going to do is it's going to produce this 3-phosphoglycerate. There's going to be six of them. We're going to need six ATPs, and then we're going to get a rearrangement to 6,1,3-bisphosphoglycerates. We're going to need six NADPHs, so we need another energy input. And then we're going to get glycerol aldehyde 3-phosphate. And this should look very familiar because we've already seen this reaction. And um, this is going to be interconverted through an isomerization into dihydroxyacetone phosphate is going to be converted into the glycerol aldehyde three phosphate. So no matter what, we end up with six of these. Because of that, we get to release one, yay! One is going to be released as one glycerol aldehyde three phosphate, which means now we have five carbons left and somehow we have to get back up into this molecule here. So we have five glycerol aldehyde three phosphates. Um, so three CO2s, it's three six three phosphoglycerates. Now we have six one three bisphosphoglycerates. Now we have six glycerol aldehyde three phosphates. So six times the um, three carbons here, so we have 18 carbons, right? So we've gotten rid of one of these three carbon molecules. So now we have five times the three carbons. So now we have uh, 15 carbons. Now we've rearranged it into three ribulose five phosphates, so now we have still 15 carbons. So we're no longer going to lose any carbons here, we're just rearranging it. Now we have three of these molecules, we're gonna add another ATP, and now we're back to the three ribulose one five bisphosphate. So again, um, this is a, a strange cycle in the fact that we're starting out not with like, for instance, in the citric acid cycle, we started out with one ox oxaloacetate. Here we actually need three ribulose one five um, bisphosphates in order for this reaction to occur and so it's going to get rearranged back into this. So really when we're fixing three CO2 molecules we're only yielding one glycerol aldehyde 3 phosphate but it's at the cost of nine ATPs, six NADPH molecules are consumed um, and then the photosynthesis of this one molecule of glycerol aldehyde 3 phosphate, it's going to roughly capture 24 protons, which can go through the electron transport chain. So even though there's a large input of energy, we're going to be able to, to um, receive protons from it. The only other thing that I wanted to, there's only two other notes for this brief video, uh, is the source of that ATP and the NADPH. So that's going to come from photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is going to be the source um, it's going to be produced in the light reactions of photosynthesis, and they're going to be the essential substrates. So we absolutely positive, positively need the light reactions to occur because that's going to produce the ATP and the NADPH. It's going to allow us to go through the Calvin cycle.